Good evening, popular astronomers. We are starting a couple of minutes early of 8 p.m. this evening to give chance uh, people a chance to catch up with the broadcast. So I'm just pootling around at the minute, just finishing getting my captions ready, finishing briefing the guests, getting my artwork ready to display, getting the prizes ready, drinking out of my SPA mug, all the things that a busy video blogger must do to bring you Pop Astro Live on a Friday night. Well, it's what? Oh, it's one minute away. I might as well start then. Good evening, popular astronomers. And how are you? My name is Vicky Duncalf. We've been doing this show, I think this might be my fifth or sixth one now. Really enjoying doing these. Um, and we have got a very fun packed evening for you tonight. So let's take a look at tonight's agenda. Well, first of all, please start contributing by commenting in the comment box on Facebook. We love banter. We love it when you ask us questions. We have got bored astronomers at home waiting to take your queries. <laughs> so if you've got any questions about astronomy, no matter what level you are at, we have got astronomers waiting to chat with you. <laughs> So please uh, feel free to drop your comments into the comment box and your queries should be answered. So then, now you can probably see that I, now I, I'm, a, I'm a devil for space apparel. The logo across the bottom is covering my chest right now and you can't actually see what's on my t-shirt. So this is going to be the big reveal, the first big reveal of the evening. Can you guess what is emblazoned? across my chest. So basically last year I Googled Galaxy t-shirts and this is what Google came back with. And the instant I saw it, I knew that I had to have it in my collection. We've got comments coming in already. Ah, oh, Ian Baker, one of our new members of the SPA. Thank you very much for joining us, Ian. As a result of seeing these videos, it's most appreciated. So um, this t-shirt, I Googled it and the instant I saw it, I just knew I had to have it in my collection. It's not really particularly galaxy-esque. I think it has got the Crab Nebula on it, but are you ready for the t-shirt? Check it out. <laughs> First of all, we've got a cowboy kitten. I think it's the Crab Nebula in the background there. And then look at this. Whoa, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. It is a shark vomiting a rainbow with a cowboy kitten on the back. And best still, if you find that noxious on the front, when I walk away from you, you get exactly the same image. How's that? It was about 10 pound, thank you very much. But for proper, decent space t-shirts, go to popastro.com, our SPA shop, and purchase yourself something that isn't quite as offensive as a shark puking up a rainbow with a cowboy kitten on its back. Speaking of which, merchandise getting the nice purple lipstick on this. Plug the mug. We have got a whole new batch of very sought after SPA mugs for you to choose from. Our dearest Paul, Paul Sutherland has been um, um, creating the captions on these mugs. And actually they are quite good, Paul, you brilliant old hack you. Uh, we've got one on the, with a picture of the sun on it here. Uh, I'm too hot to handle. So don't put it in the microwave for so long. I make my drinks the Milky Way. And of course, it's got the Milky Way across it. It's time to mug up on Mars. You can have a Mars SPA mug. I'm just going through a phase, says the SPA moon mug. And then I quite like the um, Astronomy is Looking Up mug, which has got a, a really nice kind of um, sky logo on it. Oh, no, I'm sorry, actually. My favorite is the round galaxy. That's a spiral galaxy. And it says, stirry, stirry night. Brilliant puns there. And they're available from £8.99 from popastro.com. So do support us and drink your beverage out of the most popular astronomical mugs of all time. So we have got a little competition for you this evening. We would love you to start submitting your moon pictures or moon sketches, moon craft, moon models anything that you would like, and you could win something really random that I found. It is um, it is a Carl Sagan seven inch called A Glorious Dawn. It's a rare piece of vinyl. It is composed and arranged by John Boswell, Carl Sagan, A Glorious Dawn, featuring Stephen Hawking. 
if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So this is a really rare piece of vinyl that I've had for quite a while, but it will make a beautiful prize. And if memory serves me correctly, I think it's got, has it? Oh, yes, it has. Paul Money, one of our wonderful astronomers should know all about this. On the front, oh, it's one of these with the weird big hole in it, by the way. There's no, one, no wonder I never played it. Not only is it a record in a world of MP3s, it's got the big hole in the middle, so you need that extra attachment. But still, it's a nice piece of space memorabilia. But the best thing about it is, not only can you look through it, but it's also got, you know, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this. This is going to be difficult to show. Um, do, do, do. Right, what's that? Maybe Mary McIntyre knows. Can, can you see us, Mary? Can you see? Can you see what that is? Right, I'm going to bring Mary McIntyre on. Um, I'm going to come to you in three, two, one, Mary. She is going to be talking to us about lunar sketching, and I can see her in my little thumbnail down, thumbnail down there. And I tell you, she's wearing a better t-shirt than me. Are you ready, Mary? Three, two, one. Hiya! Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, long time no see. I know it's been ages, nearly a year. Oh. Oh no, that just sucks because we do see each other on quite a frequent basis, don't we? We do. So let's put your little caption on. There you go. Mary McIntyre, lunar artist with best taste in dresses. <laughs> I didn't write that. <laughs> uh, I wrote that. So check out this this random record with uh, Carl Sagan and um, 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 Stephen Hawking on. On the back of it, can you work out what those etchings are? I think this is the etching that was put on one of the, is it on Voyager? Yes, it, and she got it in one. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so it's got that. So don't try to play that side, but show it to aliens. and They will understand exactly who you are and where you're from. <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. I just know it was on Voyager. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's got, it's got. Do you know what? I know it's got something to do with hydrogen on it, and that's about it, actually. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to look that one up before I get tested on that one. They've probably found it quite a boring record to listen to. Let us know in the comments if you know what all that was. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got six comments on going on here. Let's have a quick look. Paul Harper says, hi, all. Hi, Paul. Look at Paul. Can you see him? He's branded up. Oh, wow. <laughs> look at that. Michael Barrett says, good evening from Moot Holt Observatory near Salisbury. Hope you've got good skies tonight, Michael. Um, oh, Paul is wearing his new T-shirt, unlike me and Mary, who are not. No. <laughs> uh, and um, Pamela is saying, hi, June. Well, it's nearly July. So she's close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, excellent. So, Mary, it's so good to see you. We go back a long, long way, don't we? We do. Very, very good. We are, um, well, first of all, I think I just need to explain to everybody in the whole wide universe the wonders of the best art I ever did in my life. Let's put it in blue pack. Mary taught me, tutored me, look at that, photorealistic crater from my very first ever go at sketching a crater, Mary. Look at that. It's amazing. Looks so, like a photo. It does look like a photo. So this is the Oh, I've got another one somewhere. Well, this is, I don't know where it's gone. Oh, Mary, sorry, which crater is this? I've always wanted to know. Um, Archimedes. Archimedes, great. And then this is the one I did the year after at Solar Sphere. I've lost the original proof of it, but these are the wonderful results that you get if you follow a Mary McIntyre. That's, um, Aristarchus and Herodotus, I think. Is that how you pronounce it, Herodotus? It's Aristarchus and another one, I think. Excellent. So this is what happens when Mary um, teaches you how to draw a lunar sketch. Absolutely fantastic results. And sketching is something that I'm only just getting into, uh, Mary. Why would you say it's so important for people to have a go at sketching? Um, well, I naively thought I knew a lot about the moon um, because I did a lot of photography and I've observed the moon since I was four years old. But mm -hmm. until I actually started sketching, I don't think I ever properly looked at anything. And since I started sketching, I mainly did that because I'd gone 12 months nearly without looking through an eyepiece at all. I would open the observatory, take a picture, close the roof, go inside, process the picture, and at no point actually look at what I'd taken a picture of. I might think, oh yeah there's a nice shadow here nice shadow there and once I started sketching suddenly I can name more craters I can 
just see changes that have happened over a one hour or two hour period when I am observing. And I think to sketch something, you have to look at it properly. And I don't think I'd ever looked at the moon properly until I started trying to draw it. And it's an ever changing, beautiful landscape. And it's just such a joy to draw. And in many ways, it's really easy because it's just black and white. So it, it's actually one of the simplest things to get started with for sketching. So what do you like most about observing the moon then, Mary? I think the fact that we're so close to an entire different world and even with modest equipment, you can see exquisite detail and you're looking at mountains and craters and lava plains and you're just seeing all this stuff in another world and every kind of couple of hours the whole landscape looks different because the shadows have changed and it never gets boring it, it just never gets boring for me so um tonight the moon is probably invisible to everybody after the drastic change in weather that we've just had <laughs> not but, here um, it's still clear here <laughs> Oh my gosh! What? Oh, how was the heat for you yesterday, Mary? That was a that was worth It's been talking worse about. today, actually. It's been Has it? four degrees today. I think I've been hiding with a fan in a dark room. <laughs> oh, so it's been, oh my gosh! We've had it cold and windy here today to the point where I've got a jumper on almost. Uh, no, there's no jumpers here. <laughs> So tonight on Friday, June the 26th, 2020, the moon is in a waxing crescent phase. Now, waxing is the first phase after new moon, and it's a great time to see the features on the moon's surface. During this phase, the moon can be seen in the western sky after the sun dips below the horizon at sunset. The moon is close to the sun in the sky and mostly dark, except for the right edge of the moon, which becomes brighter as the days get closer to the next phase, which is the first quarter, with a 50% illumination. So why is it so good for sketching at this time of month then, Mary? That um, when the moon is half lit, that's when you have the most, um, well, certainly near the Terminator, which is where a lot of the interesting craters are, you get these really beautiful crater shadows because of the angle that the sun is hitting the surface. And for me, one of the things I most love about lunar sketching is those extreme dark regions and the extreme bright white ones. And you get the biggest kind of contrast between those at that phase. I, I kind of get frustrated when the press G everybody up about a full moon because in many ways it's the worst time to observe the moon but when you get it around about half lit you just have so much interesting stuff that you can see on the landscape and it was those sorts of pictures and and visions seeing these great big mountain peak shadows like casting these huge long jagged black lines that was what gave rise to some of the beautiful space art of uh, of history before we knew that actually the changing sun angle was responsible for the length of those shadows but even um if you just done some observing we obviously know the height of most of the features on the moon, but you can do a little bit of maths with your own picture, measure the height of a shadow, and it will be able to use a little bit of simple trigonometry, and you can calculate the height of the mountain that caused it, or the central peak in a crater that has caused that shadow. So it's just something that I think you can learn so much about the moon just by studying those shadows, and first quarter is definitely, and last quarter as well, definitely the best time for looking for those. Oh, wow. Did you see that? I need my hands here to explain. <laughs> Did you see on APOD, Astronomy Picture of the Day, that lunar eclipse where they'd done like a, a crescent, lots of time, well, I don't even know what they were called, multiple exposures. And I think it was from this annular eclipse and it showed all the mountains of the moon in, in relief, in shadow. Oh, Did you see that? I didn't. Oh, I'll no, have to I can't go find it. it. It's such a rare effect. I can't explain it. It was on this week's A pod, and it was like um, I don't know how to describe it. It was very, very special and unique, and I think you'll get a real kick out of it because you're very much into topography and shadows, and this was like. Oh, wow. Well, when you have a total solar eclipse, getting Bailey's beads around the edge is because of lunar craters and mountains and the fact that the edge of the moon isn't smooth so that's what gives rise to Bailey's beads <clears throat> something that I kind of didn't quite manage to catch on my first eclipse yeah. in 2017 but um, <laughs> it was our first one we didn't do too badly <laughs> I've uh, got an embarrassing story to tell about that the moment of um, it's called the engagement ring isn't it when the first bit flares out um, from behind the mountain, the first bit of the sun peeping back out. And that was when, back in the Cornwall eclipse, when my boyfriend was supposed to get down on one knee and propose to me. 
<laughs> Needless to say, I never got married. I'll just cut to the end of the too long to read version of the story. I'm still single. <laughs> his his loss. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, so I'll send you. Um, we'll put that image of um, from Apod on um, Pop Astro, <clears throat> and you can you can take a look at it because it's wonderful. Um, so I might pronounce this wrong. Claire Obscure or Claire Obscure? Claire Obscure. Yeah. She's um tell us a little bit more about who she is. <laughs> she, <laughs> it's actually from the French. So Claire is light, obscure is shadow, and it's basically the term given to the effects that are only visible for a short time every month. Um, so the lunar X is a good example, yeah, and the lunar V, which is visible around the same time. But also there's the face in Albertagnus, which looks like the um kind of side profile of a lady's face, which you can oh. see when the sun angle is correct. Um, the eyes of Clavius is another great one, and there are two small craterlets within Clavius, and when the sun angle is just right, it just looks like these two white eyes shining out from this black void. And these are very often not visible when the moon is visible from the UK, so they're a bit more of a challenge to observe because you've got to be at exactly the right phase. But just to make it even more complicated, just because the lunar X is visible at a 48% moon this month doesn't mean that it will be next month because the moon wobbles on its um, orbit on, on, on its orbit on its rotation it's kind of wobbling on its axis so I've got a sketch here which I'll just show you this is the lunar x region this moon um, this side here was a 48 percent moon this side here, you can see that the, um, the the X has almost disappeared because all the kind of landscape has become illuminated around there and the Terminator has moved that way. So everything's back to front. It's really throwing me. So, yeah, the the basically the shadow Terminator has moved. So less of the X is visible. It's kind of blending into the background. But the picture on this side was actually a 47 percent moon. So it's actually less illumination than this side but because of libration they were taken almost a year apart almost exactly a year apart which was just an accident but um so it just shows that you can't just say well the x will be visible on a 48 percent moon because that's not necessarily true but these things are probably visible for a few hours just once a month and obviously that's not always when the moon is above the horizon it's not always when there's a dark sky so they can be really hard to observe visually if it's oh, a daytime moon i know that because i fell foul of thinking that the lunar x was going to be tomorrow got all excited posted about it sent out an email <laughs> about it and whoopsie i'm sorry to anybody who might in advance to anybody who was looking forward to seeing it but mary your website has the accurate times and dates on doesn't it yeah, I mean, if you're not in the UK, you'll have a chance of seeing it because it happens around about an hour after the moon has set from the UK. But from the UK next month, we'll have a chance on a daytime moon. So, yeah, I'll, I'll when I'm done, I will put the link to my Lunar X and V times in the comments and people can have a look. So coming up shortly, we've got Luke Jerram, creator of Museum of the Moon. Did you ever get to see that, Mary? I didn't. It didn't oh. get near enough to us in Oxfordshire unfortunately but I, if it ever comes back I'm just going to go to wherever it is. I think one of the things that we actually tried to do most was spend time trying to figure out where that lunar x is but actually when it's fully illuminated it's just a big jumble no. of craters. Even like two days later it's hard to see where it is. <laughs> ah okay so next question for Mary. Um, do you have any advice for people who are new to lunar observation? Yeah, it's a really great place to start. And I know that a lot of astronomers just say, well, the moon is a source of light pollution, therefore we hate it. It stops us looking at comets and deep sky objects. But if you're a beginner, the moon is really easy to find. If you're not used to handling a telescope, it's pretty easy to get the moon in shot because it's so big and bright. You don't need very big equipment to be able to observe it, just a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. If you want to get in deeper, you can put a Barlow lens in. So it's kind of like the least amount of investment financially to be able to do some really interesting observing. But as I said earlier, the fact that the landscape is constantly changing, even kind of over a three hour period, you can see that lunar shadows have changed their length or whatever so there's always just something interesting to see and it just gets you used to the equipment it 
gets you learning about topography and learning about craters and that will just help you name them because when you get more advanced and you have a bigger telescope if you're wanting to look specifically at a thing you're going to know how to navigate your way around the lunar surface because a big telescope only shows you a tiny part of the moon so you need to know your way around to find anything so when you first start out you don't need anything fancy um, just binoculars or a small telescope and off you go and get a good lunar guide as well good lunar atlas or a map oh, where's mine i've got it my phillips one is knocking around i went on the beach yeah, it's straight really and good. i studied the moon on my with my phillips atlas while um phillips moon guide while i was um sat on the beach sizzling it was great and, and if you're not a dinosaur like me then there are apps for your phone that have the atlas on there as well <laughs> oh they're good they're good so tell us then slightly switching the subject now you've got a celebrity husband or at least in the field of astronomy tell us uh, <laughs> what mark does with relation to the SPA? He is the meteor section director. Um, Mark spends, uh, Mark is incredible. He is the brains behind everything that we have here that does astronomy. We he basically sits coding our meteor cameras all the time. He's got scripts running that do this thing, that thing, the other there thing. He is. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got a radio meteor rig here and we've got four meteor cameras at the moment with a fifth possibly in the pipeline. And yeah, he just loves coding. So he's writing scripts that can analyze things that drop aircraft captures rather than meteors. He's kind of built all of this stuff from bare bones upwards and just sits fiddling with code. And what's incredible to me is that the Meteor camera and our all sky camera that he also built from nothing, um, basically automatically creates a time lapse and uploads itself to YouTube. So I wake up in the morning and there are two YouTube videos have been uploaded. Like my YouTube channel, it takes me three days to get a video on my channel. I don't know how he's managed to write something that does it all for you. I tell you it's what amazing. I do frequent, frequently know is what the weather is in Tackley. Thank to your weather station on my yeah, Twitter. Yes, <laughs> very, it, very interesting Twitter stream, that one. I muted that. I know what the weather is in Tackley because I'm here. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't know why it's still on my feed. You feel this loyalty on Twitter, <laughs> don't you? Just not to ever delete somebody or anything to do with them. Right, Mary, we've got a game for you. Now, there are, there's something like three trillion craters on the moon and 4,000 varieties of potato. So we're now going to play crater or potato. <laughs> you have to guess whether it's a crater or a potato. And the prize is a sack of spuds or a trip to the moon, either one, whichever you would prefer. So what would Satanta be? Is it a crater or is it a potato? Satanta. I'm going to go with potato. Well done, Mary. You have won one potato. It's a red skin spud. <laughs> My favourite. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, they're so good, aren't they? Underrated red skin spuds are. Oh, yes. What about bronch? <laughs> what bronch, a great I word. think, is a crater. You are well done. So you've also now won a trip to the moon. <laughs> uh, what about Vera? Who's she? Crater or potato? That's crater as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, you really know your craters, but do you know your potatoes? Not what very well. <laughs> what about Abbott? Crater or potato? Oh, I have a feeling that's both. <gasps> How do you know this stuff? <laughs> have you been peeping at my Word document? Well, my husband has um, a kind of like half of our garden is an allotment. Oh, so you've got an allotment, I, of course, yeah. I don't do any of that. I uh, Plants <laughs> quake in their pots when I go near oh, them. I, I kill everything. But um, Mark, when he's not coding, grows vegetables. So some of these names are familiar from the Marshalls catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> We're very rock and roll here, you know. We read the Marshalls catalogue in bed at 9 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then here's a good one. Galactica. Oh, <laughs> this is for gonna, the sack of spuds now, Mary. So it's going to go over. with potato. You are correct. It's an early variety. <laughs> with it's an early variety with resistance to common scab. <laughs> well, like, who doesn't need that? <laughs> yeah, we all need. We all need that. And finally, tharp. That I think is a crater. Mary, you've got them all correct. So your moon rocket will be departing at 6 a.m. in the morning <laughs> with the sack of spuds to keep you company. Yeah, that's a crater named after Marie Tharp. Don't know who she was. Should yeah, there are really not that many craters named after women on the moon, but uh, there we go. Oh, okay. Maybe um, and probably none named after potatoes. Right. Okay. So <laughs> we are now going. <laughs> could you grow potatoes on the moon, though? That's I suppose you could. I bet that's if you're Mark Watney, you probably could. So 
Coming on now, Mary, and I'm going to merge the feeds now. Ooh, very technical. I'm going to bring on Luke Jerram, creator of Museum of the Moon, because you're both such great lunar artists. I figured that you could have a little chat to each other. <laughs> Are you ready, Luke? We're coming across to you in three, two, one. Hi, Luke. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. Don't mind our potato <laughs> chat. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. I like the uh, the potato thing. I decided I, I'd give my, I put my, oh, the other side. I've got a microscope here to sort of complement your telescope. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. My microscope's over there. I've been tidigrade hunting all week. <laughs> Ooh, very good. Hi, Luke. You you? You're in Bristol, yeah, I'm right. you? uh, yeah, everything's fine, really. Uh, it's Friday, so, yeah, I've already had one beer, so I may not remember all my scales and um, references, but, you know, I'm here. It's good. Very good to see you. So I just thought I'd let Mary have a little chat with you because obviously Mary is a very accomplished lunar sketcher. She taught me. She 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 got this out of me. I'm looking for the original photo, but it's fallen already. Yeah, this is what she taught me how to do, and it's like photorealistic. So this girl got skills. Isn't that clever? That's <laughs> very good. So yeah, Mary, you just love it, don't you? I do, and I have actually made some models of individual craters um, for. I did one for Sky at Night, but I also use it in outreach to demonstrate the sunrises and sunsets over craters. And it is really hard to make a 3D model. So I just hats off. I don't know how you did what you did with that Museum of the Moon. It's phenomenal. Like one crater would take me hours and hours and hours and hours to get it even remotely similar to the original. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, the, the, the Museum of the Moon is actually, um, it's an illusion. What, you, what you're seeing is just a flat surface. Uh, where, did, where did you see the artwork? I haven't actually seen it. I've just gone ah. off what I've seen online and it looks three-dimensional. I always thought it, it was. Well, it, it, it's effectively a balloon and right. on the outside it, it's printed with high-resolution NASA imagery. Uh, and then it's, so it is flat, but then it's got a, it's internally illuminated. And from a, at least, if you stand at least sort of two meters away, it has this incredible illusion of texture. And it looks like, wow. yeah, all the, the craters are, are sort of three dimensional. So it is, it is very much an illusion and it, it works. <laughs> it's kind did of did you yourself would, manage to put all that stuff together into one sphere? Yeah, yeah, we work wow. together. Um, <laughs> And uh, but yeah, wherever I take it, so I've I've taken it to India, and people ask me if it was made made of paper mache because of the texture. Oh, really? And then I, some people think it might be made of fiberglass or even concrete. If it was made of concrete, I calculated <laughs> it would be it would weigh about three hundred tons. Which is quite <laughs> <laughs> pretty heavy. But as it is, the the artwork is seven meters in diameter, and um, it only weighs about forty kilograms. So it's, it's no, next wow. Nothing. So I could fit one in the house then. <laughs> Possibly. Yes, you must have a big good. house. You could put it in your ballroom, <laughs> Mary, for, for where you have all your lovely um, space frocks. <laughs> 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 Mary, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I'm going to um, thank you. Uh, really good to see you. And who knows when we'll meet again? Maybe a solar sphere or something like that. We need to <laughs> see each other soon, don't we? Thank you. Bye. Nice Bye. to meet you. Bye, lovely Mary. work. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, lovely Bye. work. Lovely work. Bye. <laughs> Hi, Luke. That just makes the two of us. So Pamela said she's seen the Museum of the Moon in Glasgow. It does get around a bit, though, doesn't it? Are the multiple ones? Yeah, it's been it's been very successful. Uh, I've been making artwork now for about 20 odd years. And every 10 years, I sort of hit on something that people really um, love. And um, certainly with the moon. Yeah, we were getting sort of three or four inquiries every day, like a thousand inquiries a year. And um, and we would just say, I'm really sorry, but you can't have it for this festival because it's already booked uh, unless you can fabricate another one. And people would find the money to make it happen. So at its peak, I think we had about sort of eight moons touring simultaneously all around the, the world. It was, uh, yeah, slightly mad. It's been great, though. It's been really good. About 10 million people have seen the moon now. And um, I think that the reason why people like it so much is it there's space there for the public to talk to one another about what they're seeing. So there's space in that sort of experience to sort of share the experience with other people. So it's, it's a very it's, um, chatty, it's a very chatty experience when you go and see it, especially if you take astronomer friends. It's fantastic if you take a learned astronomer with you. Take it from me. Yeah, no, it's very nice. And they can name every crater and they give you a little guided tour. 
and people always want to know where the astronauts have landed and actually they've landed in all sorts of different places um and it is yeah i'm learning a lot about the moon as well it is it is fascinating every time i i see it and because of this lockdown i've not seen the artwork for a long time and i miss it actually i do miss it okay yeah actually yeah we'll come on to come on to that in a moment actually um but where did you come up with the idea then oh for the moon um well I, i'm living in bristol and here we've got i think the second highest tidal range in europe there's a 14 or 15 meter gap between high tide and low tide and about 15 years ago i had an idea to create an artwork controlled by the moon as a consequence of sort of cycling over the river and seeing this huge tidal variation as i cycled and looked down at the at the river this this changing tide and so i it made me yeah i spent a couple of years designing an artwork called tide which was a sort of astronomical clock that would um it would sort of sing a bit like sort of celestial spheres and change its pitch according to um, water levels. Anyway, I told that that it was fine. But back then I had this idea to create a replica moon. This was 15 years ago. But the problem was 15 years ago, the, the data wasn't available to create it. The technology, the printing technology just hadn't been invented. So it's taken a while for, for sort of technology to catch up with the idea I had. Um, uh, yeah, and it's been it's been really good. Then the moon axe is this sort of installation for people to moon bathe and lie underneath. Um, but it's also it provides an opportunity for people to go around and see the dark side. It's an inflatable sphere, so you can see the dark side of the moon. That's really nice. And of course, we can't we can't see that side of the moon from Earth. And it's very pockmarked. The lineation between um, the our side and the pockmark side. It's like it's got a bad case of acne on its body, hasn't it? The moon. Yeah, I mean, it is. There's, I think there's pot marks all over, really. But yeah, certainly on the, the face that we can see it, there's, there's more of those, it's, it's those lava fields and it's sort of flatter, I suppose. Um, it is, it is, mate. And yeah, the, 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 and then there's no lava fields really on the, um, on the, on the dark side of the moon, the far side of the moon. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. I'm sure you know all about it. Oh, now um, I remember my astronomy lecturer told me it's because the core is pulled slightly towards the Earth. I could be wrong here. Please correct me. Somebody do a quick Google from the SPA, please. But I'm fairly sure it's because the core is slightly offset towards planet Earth because the face is tidally locked of the moon to, to Earth. And um, that kind of pushes the lava up. I could be wrong. That sounds about wrong. right. That sounds good to me um but please we need a fact check on that one somebody drop it into the comments please um now i did listen to a podcast with you and one of the things i was really interested in is how you actually print it the size of the printers that you have going yeah it's it, um well i'm lucky enough to live uh yeah in bristol where we've got cameron balloons which is like the world's largest hot air balloon company and so i've been working with them over you know 10 15 years now um, and the, yeah, the printer to create this this imagery is about the size of a small caravan. So it's a massive thing, um, and yeah, we're feeding all this sort of data in to be able to to to, to print the artwork. And all. It's lovely. It kind of comes out of the printer, a little crater by crater, and it's like 72 DPI. So it's very very accurate. Um, I think yeah, one centimeter is is about five kilometers. On one centimeter on the on the moon is represents five kilometers um on the actual moon so that's yeah it's a lovely it's a beautiful thing and i do miss it there's um yeah so a, a small girl came up to me and she said um when she saw the artwork she said will you put the moon back afterwards so she thought i'd stolen the real moon I thought that uh, was really cute. like moonraker oh hang on yeah paul is saying paul sutherland is is chiding us he's one of our spa bosses yes sir the uh it's not the dark side it's the far side the whole moon gets equal amounts of light and darkness but luke knows I that, know, I knew I that. Know. but yes people i don't know it's funny isn't it there's the word that people do talk about the dark side of the moon but i think you could describe it as dark as in knowledge as Ooh, in you, know, you know that's what i mean better, yeah so of course yeah. Yeah. we know exactly what you mean yeah, we know my excuse have but you yeah, it been... is the far side of the moon. I tend to try to refer to it as both, so people who don't know about science can sort of understand what we're talking about. I don't know. Okay, so we've got Mary here saying, have you ever, ever seen the Lunar X, Luke? Very obscure set of craters that form an X shape. Oh, yes. No, I, I just saw it then. I had heard about it before, yeah. 
it's really exciting to try and see. And Mary also says, I'm currently reading the story of James Sadler, the first English air balloon pilot. So this is really interesting. Oh, the balloon link then, the Bristol balloon link. Yeah, it's very good. I've got another project called the Sky Orchestra where we play music from hot air balloons <gasps> uh, at about 6.30 in the morning. And we try to sort of affect people's dreams as we fly over their houses playing this music into their bedrooms that's a nice project it's been quite fun seriously that is a, an amazing one when's that going to be launching uh well we've toured it all around the world but i'm going to yeah. try and perform over bristol in the next couple of weeks to sort of raise people's spirits after the lockdown and the people reporting that it's giving them crazy dreams uh well we ended up doing sort of scientific experiments where we we would bring people into a giant concert hall uh, and they would sleep overnight and then we would play little sound samples to them and the idea is they would incorporate that that dreaming content uh you know into their into their dreams the sounds would get so if they heard a seagull you know uh in the middle of the night perhaps they would dream about being by the sea uh, and we did all these sort of crazy experiments um what we mainly found was that yeah we had 120 people in a, in a big room and we analyzed their dreams in the morning fantastic uh, after they'd written them down but we mainly found that people dreamt about being in a big room with 120 other people which <laughs> is not that surprising is it really so um the museum at the moon appears in some pretty wild places i was at blue dot have you been to blue dot festival at jodrell bank yeah it's a great place yeah it was really cool we put the earth there because uh, i've made a replica earth uh, yeah. and the earth was there first i think 20 2018 20 mm -hmm. and then yeah last year the moon was there as well so I, I put the moon there it was very muddy and a bit wet not much I, i'm fully aware because i shouldn't have been there and ended up for three days without my wellies and i did 35 miles around that site and completely missed the moon every single time i never found yeah. it in there so do you i guess you've got some quite amusing or rock and roll or crazy stories about anything that might have happened having it in these wild and wonderful places uh well we were at blue dot um and I had this report that that, that that TNT had effectively lost a moon that we oh. were sending over to uh, to Austria. So it was a Blue Dot Festival, and they, and TNT said, "I'm really sorry, we've lost the moon." Um, <laughs> and I just thought, "Oh God," because it was we were contracted to present it in Austria, and um, and they just sent me the insurance forms. And I thought, "Oh no, they they you know they really have lost it." So I I I, I sort of tweeted a little message to I think the BBC and they picked it up and then it suddenly went viral you know in the Daily <laughs> Mail the headline was um the now the postman has lost the moon and, <laughs> and there was a sort of hashtag find the moon and then it became this massive international story with reports as far as Japan and Australia about how how we've lost the moon and uh they managed you know TNT managed to find it in the end in some warehouse on the edge of Germany I think um so it all worked out in the end and the publicity you know we ended up with another 30 inquiries off the back of it <laughs> just, wow uh, yeah it's quite fun i wish that happened when hermes lost my parcel <laughs> yeah well it depends what the parcel is you see if it's uh <laughs> if it's not quite the same but yeah if you can if you can lose something that has a uh a story to tell perhaps um yeah there's yeah uh, i'll try that next it. time so one of the things that strikes you when you are gazing at the moon and gaia as well the the earth installation that you did is this kind of very almost like what astronauts must report when you cannot take your eyes from it it feels like you're moonstruck you are mesmerized by it like a rabbit in the headlights and just want to gaze and gaze and gaze now you did say that you missed it earlier but do you still get that feeling when you see it that, that kind of like it's not your creation that it is actually the moon and she's hypnotized you yeah i do get that i remember the the first time i saw it properly um uh and i i saw it do, having this optical illusion this illusion of texture and i thought oh this is good you know because you never when you're building an artwork you don't really don't really know what it's going to be like until it's completed and presented properly and when i first saw it i was i was, I was pretty pleased and i thought oh, this is going to fly and it, and, it, and it really did actually the first the first moon we made was presented at the bristol balloon fiesta and it was full of helium it's a helium filled balloon um and i didn't know anything about gas filled balloons and cameron balloons installed it and they just handed it over to me like there we are it's your responsibility now and the whole thing was swaying around and then it popped on live television it was a complete disaster <laughs> and um 
but I always say, you know, you, it's about, well, you don't know what you don't know, I suppose. Uh, but it's about learning from mistakes. And I think with artists and scientists, there is that relationship that there's a lot of failure involved. And you mm -hmm. have to learn from your failures and you learn more from your from failures than you do from your successes. But and I say Amen nature of that. doing new stuff is that you nature of doing new stuff is you have to be willing to fail. And that involves taking risks. Um, you win or you learn, Luke. That's my new favorite expression. You win or you learn. <laughs> I like that. Every time yeah. something goes wrong, I go, well, you win or learn. So suck you it win up. Or learn. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. It changes your um your point of reference for stuff. Now <laughs> I'm intrigued to know how you ended up with a massive giant, giant glass sculpture of COVID virus before the outbreak. Oh yeah, so uh, I've been building, I wonder if I've got any photographs of it. I've been making sculptures of, of viruses for um, uh, about 15 years now. I'm colorblind, so um, uh, I'm sort of red-green colorblind. So that has given me an interest in visual perception and thinking about how the processes of how we see. And I was about 15 years ago, I was looking through a newspaper and saw a, a photograph. It was a dark, it was a photograph, an elect colored electron microscope image of a, of a HIV um, yeah, virus in a photograph used to illustrate a story in a newspaper. And it didn't take me long to, to work out that really viruses are incredibly small. They're sort of, I don't know, 100 nanometers across. So they don't, they're actually smaller than the wavelength of light itself. So really they don't, have color and so i created my first sort of glass virus version um back then in in 20, 2004 and it's become this large body of work and these glass viruses are in museums all around the world from the metropolitan museum to the welcome collection um, and the photographs have become part of the language of virology as well so the imagery gets used in medical books and textbooks as well um, but yes, it was uh, in January this year that uh, Duke, Duke University over in America asked me to make the COVID-19 sculpture. Uh, and back then, we didn't really know what the implications were. It just felt like a kind of virus that was beginning to take hold and being slightly problematic over in China. Um, but when the artwork was completed, uh, we, you know, I was then we had this sculpture that Christ, you know, this 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 artwork is, is has a lot more resonance now uh, and just before the lockdown uh, i invited the journalists in to come and take some photographs of it um, so that the those photographs could be used in medical uh, you know news reports to help sort of tell the story of of, of what and to sort of help visualize and represent what the viruses really look like um, so yeah it's it's become a bit of a thing isn't it it's, it's a bit of a beast that glass sculpture is how big is it about that big it's about this big it's about the size of a football okay about the size of, about the size of my head it's about two million times larger than the real thing uh if you go to lukejerum.com there's lots of photographs of it in films and things like that oh there we are i've got some there are these are some of the other ones we've got these are, this is a hi oh there's a hiv that's an untitled future mutation this is a, it's a smallpox so they're very they're very beautiful things and they're sort of exactly on the opposite uh scale to to my to my moon which is which is very different there's a moon oh so lovely. There that's great that is wonderful well luke being so i'm interested in scale <laughs> excellent well thank you being as you've been such a wonderful guest you also get to play creator or potato Oh, gosh. Oh, no. Well, I'm not going to do so well, am I? Because I don't really know my craters or my potatoes. I'm going to give you a clue. Just guess random. <laughs> okay, very good, yeah. Okay, this is a good one, though. This is a good one. And I'm going to say it knobbly. Is knobbly a potato or a crotato or cr crater? <laughs> it, well, that's got to be a potato, isn't it? It's a crater. Okay, oh, it's not. Sorry. <laughs> it's a crater <laughs> named after Leopoldo Nobili, maybe that might be. Maybe not knobbly, and maybe not really. Yeah. Uh, so you've got yeah, zero. You've got me with your accent. What about Ant <laughs> what about Antarctica? Crater or potato? Oh, you would think that would be a crater. You have got two wrong. It's a potato of the main crop variety. <laughs> what about harmony? That's a good one, because that could be definitely one or the other. 
It could. Well, I'm going to go with crater because that sounds like. Uh, uh. <laughs> <Come on again. laughs> All right, then. What about gravity? I, I, I don't like this game. <laughs> <laughs> gravity is just a really cool film. I, I like. Uh, crater uh, or potato? Uh, potato. Well done. You got one right. It's got yellow. Hey, and then a final one, just because I'm feeling slightly continental and I like a French accent, Le Croix. Le Croix. Crater cross. or uh, well, Pont de Pierre. Really, sounds like the cross. So let's say, that's a, let's say that's a crater. You got two out of six. Well done, Luke. It's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Mary, who was on previously, won all the potatoes and the trip to the moon. Unfortunately, you're going to walk away empty. Well, she's a specialist. I'm an artist. I don't feel I should know about all these things. Very good, Luke. It's been an absolute delight having you on. Thank you very, very much. A lot of fun. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice thank you. See you soon, soon, Luke. Yeah, I'm hopefully see one of your incredible installations soon once the world gets back up and running. Yeah, go to lukejerum.com and just follow the links and you'll find we've got a moon website and an earth website. We've built a Mars artwork now as well, so you can have a look at that. And it, these room. artworks are touring, so just um, anyone who wants them, send me an email and I will send you the moon. Ah, oh, thank you. On a stick for me, please. Stick. Yeah. Thank you very much, Luke. Catch you later. Bye. Bye-bye. That was great, wasn't it? So let's go back to Pop Astro Live. So, okay, we have got a little imagery competition. Submit your image to competition at popastro.com and you can win this really random single, Carl Sagan, A Glorious Dawn featuring Stephen Hawking. And on the back of it, it's got the Voyager etchings. At least I think it's Voyager. It might be Pioneer, actually. I'm fairly sure that's Voyager. What do you reckon? That's a cool bit of space memorabilia that you could be winning if you submit your lunar sketching artwork craft giant inflatable moon to competition at popastro.com. Great stuff. Okay, so coming up in a moment, we have got Dave Graham. He is the... This is why when I was a DJ, all my DJ boxes used to get absolutely messed up because my skills at putting records back in sleeves was poor at the best of times. We've got Dave Graham coming on any moment now. Maybe he's ready to speak to in a moment. Thank you very much to Luke there. First of all, I'm going to, I haven't got a picture to show you. Um, my very simple way of remembering the three main craters on the moon. And it's quite random, but it really helps me. There's Tycho at the bottom, Copernicus in the middle, and Plato at the top. And these are some of the moon's most lavish raid craters and easy ones to spot through binoculars or a small telescope and the way to remember them is what did your mum used to put on your knees if you ever fell over when you were a kid and it used to sting and make you cry what's the brown stuff it's not iodine it was tcp the brand name of the stinky antiseptic so the craters go t at the bottom c in the middle and p at the top tycho Copernicus and Plato. And that's how I remember the three craters on the moon. If you've got any bizarre antiseptic related ways of remembering astronomical objects, please do let us know. So hopefully, oh, we should have Dave Graham on. Where's he gone? Let's just check. We're waiting for our lunar section director to come on. He has been hovering in the green room, but now he's disappeared. So let's just have a look. Hi, Vicky. I'm doing my best to watch. It's fun. Okay. Hi, Dave. We're waiting for you. Do you want to try connecting back up, please? It'd be great to have you on. Uh, we are going to be grilling Dave about being the section director for the SPA. We're just going to give him a couple of minutes to hook up to the broadcast. Um, he's also going to play creator or potato. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm just looking for my magazine. Here it is. This is our wonderful SPA magazine. This is just one of the many benefits of being an SPA member. It would be awesome if you could join us. We are the UK's probably the largest um, astronomical society. We are national. Not only do you get access to meetings and exclusive content, but you get this really good magazine. It's just a mainstay constantly in my house. It takes me about two months to get through it with all the other stuff that I read. But it's just lovely to dip in and out of. You've got junior stargazers headed up by Lucy Green, whose picture I actually cut out and used for a competition. Sorry, Lucy. Um, so this is just a fantastic magazine. But the thing that makes this different from all of the other astronomy magazines is that you get 
to contribute. So as Mary McIntyre, who was just on earlier, was saying, her husband, Mark, is the Meteor Section Director. Last week, we had Sandra Brantingham on, who was the NLC and Aurora Section Director. If you have been looking out of your window in a northeasterly direction this past couple of nights, hopefully you will have seen noctilucent clouds. Uh, we have got planetary section reports, little lovely tiny diagrams that you can um, submit yourself. I mean, look at this tiny little thing here. It's just such a dainty little picture. These tiny little observations, which are made by our SPA members, and you get your name up in paper. It's just wonderful. Who took this? Venus, 19th of January. Dave Finnegan inhales Owen. Where's that? Is that in Cheshire? And then little pictures of Venus. Venus is back out in the mornings. Have you seen her yet? She's gone around, popped out on the other side, and now she's lovely and crescent-like on the opposite side. So, yes, that would be great. It looks like Dave is not turning up. Um, I'm just going to fish around for him in the on the internet somewhere. Hello, Dave. Where are you? You might have to, Dave, if you're watching this, please could you go back to the email, click on the link and come back in and hopefully you should pop out on the broadcast. It would be really good if you could because we're dying to speak to you because after all, it is all about the SPA this and encouraging people to join and showing what fun. Oh, here he is. Oh, Robin's come on. Oh, it's Robin. Robin is a stunt double. Should we come straight over to you, Robin? We had Robin waiting in the wings on high alert for if this happens. So I'm going to come across to you now in three, two, one, Robin. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, you saved me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the plan worked. Hang on, I've got to adjust the camera. I wasn't planning to be here, but here I am. Oh, anyway. I know you're so busy with other stuff as well. Well, I've got to stop the uh, the live stream because hold on, just just wait a bit because I've got to stop the live stream. Right uh, there, we go. Right, I'm back in, back with you again now. Hey, wasn't Luke Jerem great? Absolutely, yes. I was enthralled, and I loved the crater or potato. I thought that was brilliant. Oh, well, you get you get to play your own version of it as well, Robin. Yeah, as well, thank you. I'm I... really looking forward to that. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> that, now quite... we know why Dave packed it in. <laughs> as soon as you quite... told him that. <laughs> <laughs> How are you keeping, Robin? How's lockdown? I, I am fine, thank you very much. I've been out in the garden a bit today. And I went, and you know, I'm interested in glowworms. I actually saw three glowworms last night, the first I've seen this year. And um, uh, so uh, they're, they're, they are definitely around and they're absolutely lovely. And it's been lovely weather for them. And we had a gorgeous night yesterday, just looking for glowworms and so on. And I've done a, the other thing a, a couple of nights ago, I did a live um, what's in the sky tonight. And you can find that on Facebook as well. Um, so uh, I go around the whole sky, last quarter of an hour, goes around the whole sky, just picking out the bright constellations. Members of the SBA probably know all the constellations, but let those who don't know the constellations who ask you how to find the constellations, let those let those folk know where it is, and they may learn something. hope so. It's a very good guide, actually, Robin, because it's quite au naturel. Um, it's very um, – do you do – which phone do you do that on? Or it's not all? a phone. No, it's uh, a proper, That's why it's so good. A proper camera. Is, uh, it, uh, have we got it here? No. Uh, it's a Sony A7S camera, <clears throat> absolutely top of the range. No, not of your phone nonsense, no. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was on a phone. It's Kath uh, who does her videos on the phone. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful sky guide and very kind of au naturel and um, nothing too pimped up, as it were. Thank you. I'm not sure if, 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 I, if that was a good idea, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Um, it's really good. Thank you very much. And Sandra Grace, who's one of my friends from North Wales Astro, she's a big Mars enthusiast, and she's finally joined the SPA. Yeah, so that's I saw great her news. Membership coming in today. Thank you for joining. Oh, thanks, Kat. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. That's very, very kind of you. So, what's happening on the moon um, in the next couple of nights, Robin? If you if you know, uh, well. Uh, Tonight we, I, I, I must admit, I haven't done, I haven't looked at the moon for a couple of nights. It was absolutely gorgeous last night. A lovely thin crescent, thin crescent. It will be Romania crescent uh, for the next couple of nights, two or three nights. I can't remember when first quarter is. Perhaps you can help me, Vicky. Can you? Did you look it up? Um, it's on my oh. list somewhere. 
right, it's coming well, anyway, up. It's in a couple of nights. As, as you've, yeah, I think so. This is the best time, really, to start looking at the moon because while it's a thin crescent, I, I don't, I just tried looking for it out of my window. I can't see it yet. It's a bit bright at the moment, but you can start looking for it in, in daylight as a crescent. You can see it up there uh, over in the western part of the sky. And as you watch, night by night and hopefully we'll get a few clear nights you can see it increasing in in its size and then a couple of nights time as you say it will be first quarter it really is the best time to start looking at the moon when it's at first quarter um or any time when there are craters to be seen when there's a bit of shadow on the moon and as mary was saying once you get to full moon um you you lose all the 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 the, uh, the fine detail and it's just a very bland light and dark thing without all those wonderful shadows and what i love is watching the 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 uh, when you've got a, a flat bit on the moon and you can see the shadows of the of the mountains on the moon and this gave rise to one of the great myths about the moon and that is that the mountains on the moon are very jagged because when you're looking at the uh, at a flat crate like like you showed plato earlier on um uh, you mentioned plato uh, the, the the shadows of the Lu, the lunar mo uh, lunar craters uh, lunar, lunar mountains look very sharp and so people got the impression that the relief on the moon must be must be very jagged and a bit like pluto it's... pluto's yeah. jagged isn't it well yeah the, the thing is it's a bit like you know if you're looking at a, a field at the sunset and the the hedgerows all look um the shadows of the hedgerows all look the same way they're 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 very obvious and when you actually go to the moon then you that as the astronauts did you find that the the, the, the everything is very much more undulating and the pictures that were drawn in the even in the 19th century even by people who should have uh, who studied the moon they all drew these very spiky craters you know one thing i reckon that one of the best reasons why we know that the apollo astronauts actually went to the moon is that if it had been created by hollywood they'd have given us much more exciting backgrounds wouldn't they they would have put nice jagged mountains that people expected to see instead of the very flat boring terrain that apollo 11 astronauts landed in the moon is nothing like as jagged as as you would like as you would expect it to be but you can see that for yourself by looking at the those wonderful jagged shadows on the moon at around first quarter look at the the uh, the, the shadows on the moon absolutely wonderful and as you watch and as mary was saying as you watch and try and do a drawing then over a passion of just an hour or two then you find that the <clears throat> that the craters have changed their length and maybe a bit of light on the far side of the crater has suddenly started to appear so just a matter of an, an hour or two is enough to see sunrise occurring over over a crater absolutely wonderful to watch oh i can't hear you i pressed the wrong button yeah ah oh. Beautiful, everybody. So now is the time to start watching the moon. We've just got a couple more comments. Then we're going to go straight to the uh, star of the show, Crater or Potato. Uh, we have got uh, Michael Barrett. Thank you so much. We've shared your link for our own page, hoping some will join the SPA. Please share these videos and details of the SPA amongst your local astronomy societies. Why is it important for us to get the numbers up with the SPA, Robin? Because it's a great organisation. Yeah, we... We, we would love to get the, the message out to more people because I'm sure that I really think that the, the problem is that not enough people know about the SBA and we really yes, need to yes, spread yes. it. A lot of people actually uh, leave the society or left the society a few years ago, um, maybe because they're a bit short of cash or something like that. And then in recent months, they've been coming back to the SBA and saying, I'm really glad I rejoined because it is a unique society and there's nothing really like it as this program shows there's nothing else like this on uh, <laughs> on, on live anywhere is, there is uh, uh, crater or potato you you've got to hand it to you nobody else has done that so uh, uh, it's but, a bit of fun yeah. the, the reason i do astronomy robin for me as you know i'm a very amateur with the telescope i do it for the fun aspect i meet some great characters i've got so many brilliant friends we've all got a little twinkle twinkle little star in our eyes haven't we Absolutely. And our, our catch line is we make stargazing fun. And I think with a show like yours, that's that really brings it true. Thank you, Robin. And with no further ado, let's hit you with it. Right. Um, let's hit you with it. Doppler, crater or potato? Definitely a crater. 
No, it's a fast-moving potato thrown past the head. No, it's a mule. No, 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 <laughs> no, no it's no, definitely no. a crater. You can't you get a, that way. <laughs> you, get a, you get a bonus point if you can give me his full name. Carl. J. Christian Doppler. J, you, well, oh well. Don't worry <laughs> okay, what about Merlin? Creator or potato? That has to be a potato. Well done. It's a high yield with a good tolerance. Yeah, sounds wonderful. <laughs> a Victoria? Ah, now that could be either, but I think that it's got to be a crater because if it were a potato, people would think it was a plum. I'm afraid it's a potato, Robin, and it's ideal for fish fryers. So if you need a chip shop, that's the information you need if you're going to open a chippy. Pioneer! I'm sure that there must be a lunar crater called Pioneer named after one of these the, the, the spacecraft. So I'm going for crater on that one. Well, the judge's decision is final. For me, it's a spud with a good resistance to powdery scab. There you go. <laughs> and finally, Castorina, crater or potato? Ah, now that is definitely a crater. And there's a lovely oh, trio of craters, which I think is probably on the moon about now, uh, visible about now. Uh, Katerina, Theophilus and Cyrillus and they are a wonderful uh, chain of, of three craters and uh, they, they, they are the first craters ever to be drawn on the moon. Thomas Harriot actually drew his first drawing of the, made his first drawing of the moon before Galileo and on his first drawing of the crescent moon you can see those three craters including Katerina mentioned so definitely a crater. Correct. Well done, Robin. Your crater and potato knowledge is par excellence. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to clear off now until next week. We have to think of a subject to do next week. What could we do, Robin? You've been helping me immensely with these broadcasts. So thank you very much, by the way. Yeah, I'll think about it and, uh, and we'll let everyone know via Facebook. Yes, very good, Robin. OK, so please like, tag, share this video, share it amongst your societies um, and please join the SPA because we are marvellous. End of story. <laughs> we certainly are. And a bet, what about that, Robin? Isn't that a beast? I'm not sure it's my style in T-shirts, personally. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> mixed bag, mixed reports yeah, on the T-shirt. I've just got one saying Pop Astro. There you go. How about that? Oh, that's nice. That looks vintage, Robin. Yeah, that's a one-off. I want one of them. All right, Robin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for standing in for Dave. Don't know where okay. he got to. <laughs> Bye. He can come on next week. Thank you to Luke. Thank you to Mary McIntyre. It's been a wonderful show. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.